Why would I want to go to war against the NCR? They're my best customers. If their leaders weren't scheming to steal Vegas out from under me, I'd have no troubles with the NCR at all. Alright, welcome back to Honored Madman. We've got a special video for you guys today. We're going to be talking about the Fallout series and the Fallout games today. So we're going to go over the various cliffhangers we got in the final episode and all the new lore we learned. I know not everyone has loved the show, but I really, really think they knocked it out of the park. It's filled with mysteries, and I think we can use our knowledge of the games to unravel some of them, and that's what we're going to do in this video. We're probably also going to spend an inordinate amount of time talking about that meeting between vault Tech and the other corporation heads. But let's start with the big cliffhanger that's probably mentioned in the thumbnail. Near the end of the final episode, it's revealed that Lucy's dad, Hank McLean, is actually a pretty bad dude. Unlike the dad in Fallout 3 who harshly judges you for nuking a settlement, Hank is surprisingly chaotic because when his wife ran off with the kids, his response was to first locate her in Shady Sands, secure the kids, and then nuke Shady Sands. Shady Sands, of course, was the first settlement of the NCR founded by Aradesh, the father of Tandy, essentially the founding bloodline of the NCR. Like, they had elected leaders, but it was always Tandy, and, you know, it was after Aradesh died, but Tandy ruled for, like, 50 years. We see, though, by the time of New Vegas that the current president is sort of just this corrupt warmonger. We can get into that in a whole separate video as to whether or not Hank's destruction of Shady Sands was justified because of how bloated and corrupt the NCR's government had become by that time. That's a whole other story and it could be an interesting video. Anyway though, after just having decimated a whole squad of heavily armed Brotherhood Knights, Cooper Howard, aka The Ghoul, shoots Hank and it grazes him in the face and interrogates him as to where his family is. Hank only grins and then flies off. The ghoul presumably only let him go so he could follow him, and in the very last shot of the episode we see Hank again, and we see where he's heading. A much more desolate New Vegas. And it's here where the next season will probably take place, as the ghoul and Lucy are closely following Hank. But what happened to New Vegas? Why does it look so barren as opposed to how it looked when we last saw it? It's not completely barren, as you can see there's a couple settlements it looks like in the surrounding region around New Vegas. But the overpass is gone, Cap McCarran, Crimson Caravans, the Thorn, all of it looks gone. It also looks like the sharecropper farms have been reclaimed by the desert. And if Freeside's around, it's probably only a marginally worse place to live. But I guess the big question from this is, what happened to Vegas? And more importantly, why is Hank heading there? Well, if you've played uh, New Vegas, you're familiar with this character named Mr. House. He's essentially this tech billionaire who survived the uh, apocalypse in some way or another. And he ruled over New Vegas after single-handedly saving it from destruction. And judging by the state of New Vegas in the final episode's end credit sequence, all of his hard work might have amounted up to nothing. The dead Securitrons are certainly a foreboding sight. And we'll go into more detail on Mr. House and how he did all that later. But what's important to note is that Hank was the former assistant to Barb, you know, picking up her dry cleaning, stuff like that. And we know Barb, who is Cooper Howard's wife, was at the big vault Tech conspiracy meeting that also featured Mr. House. And she even got to make the big reveal of vault Tech being responsible for dropping the bombs, or at least planning to be. So I think Hank seeking out New Vegas is his way of trying to figure out where his superiors are. Maybe he needs Mr. House's help to do that. Maybe Barb and her vault Tech remnant have overthrown Mr. House. After perhaps manipulating the NCR to attack House as retaliation for what happened to Shady Sands. Maybe they framed House. There's definitely a lot of possibilities there, but let's examine further this vault Tech meeting with the other billionaire corporation guys. It's suggested by one of the attendees of the meeting that vault Tech's earnings have been down, but basically vault Tech it needs more investments. So it sits down the heads of these various powerful corporations, and it basically offers all these individuals their own personal sandbox in the form of several vaults that they can claim in exchange for their investment. Basically just a bunch of mad science themed fiefdoms for them to troubleshoot their ideas for how to remake the world. All from the safety of the vaults that vault Tech will be providing them with, in exchange for the monetary assistance. And in order to guarantee a return on all their investments, vault Tech plans to drop the bombs themselves, or at least be behind it. And basically they're offering these corporation leaders uh, an entry into the great game of who gets to make the future. They're obviously not all aligned in their interests, but they're all sort of starting with the same advantages that each of them have if they choose to take part in vault Tech's uh, 
well, for lack of a better term, conspiracy. It's basically a may the best corporation win sort of thing. And it reminds me of the great game as mentioned by Desmond Lockhart and Professor Calvert in the Point Lookout DLC of Fallout 3. And basically they talk a lot about how a bunch of influential billionaires and politicians always knew the Great War was coming and how some of them survived it and are still playing this game for power and influence till this day for who gets to inherit the world. I do think it was a little bit of a missed opportunity to not have Desmond Lockhart or at least some form of Calvert being at this meeting or having some sort of Calvert politician be mentioned, but I suppose there's already enough interesting individuals at the meeting. Speaking of which, present at this meeting of uh, vault tex shareholders or board members or investors or whatever it is, is Julian Masters of Repcon. You might know Repcon's rocket facilities from the Come Fly With Me quest in New Vegas. Another present is this West Tech guy who wants to make FEV super mutants out of illegal immigrants. Also present at this meeting is none other than Mr. House. Instantly recognizable from how he looked in Fallout New Vegas. The other significant individual who folks might remember from Fallout New Vegas or at least one of its DLCs is a Frederick Sinclair who the show has listed as a chief of research at Big Mountain, which is an interesting choice. Because while he did commission Big Mountain to create certain things for him, I don't remember him referred to as having a position of power at Big Mountain, but he could just be one of their benefactors, you know, an investor. And that would allow him some degree of power over Big Mountain, and it would allow him to sit in on meetings like this. Big Mountain was famously the setting of the awesome DLC Old World Blues for New Vegas. I think it's tied with Dead Money as being my favorite DLC for Fallout, but uh, it's a real fun time. But what's interesting is the Big Mountain DLC is not the one that Sinclair is closely associated with. That one would be Dead Money. Anyway though, Sinclair is certainly an interesting individual, perhaps not as much as Mr. House, who, at least in the game, he's far more human than. From what I gather, he was outwardly nice with a bit of an obsessive streak. He was friends with Dean Domino, but he had failsafes in place in case the future gold tried to steal his riches from him. Even 200 years later, Domino would feel destined to fall in Sinclair's trap. Sinclair's major weakness was his heart. Quite possibly the biggest simp in Fallout history, he built an entire over-the-top extravagant hotel for a girl who had no romantic interest in him. Interestingly enough, Sinclair, who looks way different than he did in the games, starts off as low-key hostile to the vault tech executive Bud, but of course Mr. House has to bring him down a peg by reminding him that he runs a casino. Now if you've ever played the Fallout New Vegas DLC Dead Money, then you're familiar with the casino in question, the Sierra Madre. The show lists him as a big mountain research executive, which sort of lines up with his lore, it's a little, little vague. The Cloud was a product of Big Mountain Research, and so were the vending machines. But if I recall in New Vegas, he was not a member of Big Mountain Research. He was merely a client of theirs who commissioned those things to be made for his hotel and casino, the Sierra Madre. Interestingly enough, though, Sinclair, much like House, had long predicted that the uh, nuclear holocaust was inevitable. And his whole casino, the Sierra Madre, was meant to survive the apocalypse and thrive after it. It was basically the ultimate gift for Vera Keys, who he was in love with, and who he really wanted to survive the war. All of the advanced tech he had commissioned to be developed at Big Mountain was made to ensure that outcome. The holograms, the vending machines, all of it, the cloud. Sinclair was a bit obsessive, if nothing else. As I mentioned earlier, Sinclair looks vastly different to how he was portrayed in the artwork for the Dead Money DLC. He's much heavier than he appeared in Dead Money. Perhaps the showrunners felt that he resembled Mr. House too much, or perhaps looked too nice for how overtly sinister they were going to make him in the TV series. That would explain his redesign into the People Eater from Fury Road. And I suppose this look is a bit more befitting of a guy who had the financial troubles that Sinclair had around this time. So I guess it kind of adds up. I do feel they've changed this character a little bit too much, but we only saw him for a couple minutes, so who knows where they go with him next, if they go anywhere with him next. Personally, I prefer the uh, more Walt Disney style look he had in Dead Money, but that's just me. I mean, does this look like the type of guy who would view himself as a romantic rival to a singer like Dean Domino over a starlet like Vera Keys? It's not for me to say, but it looks like Sinclair, at least at this meeting, really took the words letting go to heart as he's completely let himself go, but I'm already getting off topic again. So what's important to note is that Mr. House, along with these other corporate heads, were explicitly made aware of vault Tech's plans and were even invited to join them. Now, Robert House famously never worked too well with others. He even says himself in New Vegas that he has no desire to answer or participate in any kind of board. What House is after is autocracy, something he feels is uh, morally justifiable if you're him. 
or someone as accomplished as him, which, you know, we can't really argue with him at the uh, start of New Vegas, I guess, now can we? So well, House was definitely made aware of their plans. We don't know yet how involved he was, if at all, with them. I like to think that he kept vault and the other corporations around as customers, but nothing more. He's also the major one giving pushback in the meeting, likening vault dwellers to lab rats and doubts the overall success of the prospect of people surviving in these vaults in the first place, even if they outlive all their competition topside, something House has undoubtedly been making his own preparations for. In New Vegas, Mr. House claims to have calculated that a nuclear apocalypse was inevitable something around 15 or so years before it actually happened, so there's a good chance that he already had some sort of preparations in order by the time he uh, attended this vault tech meeting. Also, who are these suit-wearing silhouettes who are watching in on the meeting? Could this be the shadowy government cabal that would eventually evolve into the Enclave? I definitely think it's possible. They may have outsourced America's survival to vault tech but not their own. There is even a good chance that vault tech screwed them over, forcing them to survive on their own as the Enclave. Personally, I can't see this shadowy government cabal trusting their safety to vault tech They had to assume a private corporation like that would have its own agendas. At one point in the meeting, Barb appears to receive a message on her Pip-Boy from them. It's when all the investors are squabbling, and I imagine it said something to the effect of, uh, bring them all back into order, please. She also sort of looks up at the shadowy figure, and that's when she begins her little presentation talking about her daughter and safety and all that good stuff. But I'm guessing these shadowy guys whose faces remain obscure to us are meant to represent the future Enclave, and that they too were aware of vault Tech's plans. It would have been a nice touch for one of them to have been referred to as Calvert, but again, I'm asking for too much here. Anyway, though, Mr. House was the only one who was less than impressed by vault Tech's offer. He's not jumping out of his seat making suggestions like the other investors are. He merely calls it a fun idea and keeps his composure. And we never really got to see where he landed on the vault tech proposal. He admits it is potential but seems more concerned with how they can guarantee results or a return on their investments. And I think this portrayal of House is pretty good, especially his cocky attitude. He does give off this air of having everything already figured out, doesn't he? I think it makes sense for his character to be the most apprehensive at giving vault tech money, especially compared to how the other investors are immediately on board as soon as the idea is proposed. Even Frederick Sinclair, who may as well be a brand new character, is frothing at the mouth coming up with ideas for this new potential sandbox he can run or have his scientists run, which already is kind of confusing because in the context of this show, this guy is in charge of Big Mountain Research Group. He already has access to the most high quality science labs and facilities and scientific minds, as well as his own personal sandbox in the Big Mountain Crater. So it's kind of confusing why he's so blown away by this opportunity vault Tech's presenting them. The only one who didn't get their nips blown off by this idea was, unsurprisingly, Mr. House. I think the reason why House isn't all that impressed is because he's already been making his own preparations. He's already probably doing something similar with his own secure sites. And I also find it interesting that he asked, you know, how can they guarantee results if uh, a nuclear holocaust is technically hypothetical? Even to House, who's ran that calculation and views it as inevitable, he's like, well, how can you guarantee when it's going to happen? And sure, he might play along on the surface, but I don't think he's ever fully throwing his lot in with vault Tech. He's really not the type to put all of his eggs, or any really, into a basket he didn't own and design himself. That's just how Mr. House is. Now, this could be why there was a vault built so close to the Lucky 38 and even possibly had a tunnel that led to it that Mr. House would later have to fill in with cement. Vault 21, to be exact. Now perhaps this vault was one of the ones that was given to House or that House was allowed to claim as his own. But having him be responsible for all the different various uh, social experiments, for lack of a better term, that happened in the vaults of the Mojave is a bit of a reach. That doesn't really line up with his character and there's not much there to support it. But moving on. If vault Tech really was the ones who dropped the bombs and House was involved with them, why were so many nukes directed at Las Vegas where House's base of operations was? The only reason Vegas isn't just another smoldering crater is because of the defensive strategic grid of Mr. House. It neutralized 59 of the nukes and rendered them inert before they ever hit the ground. The laser cannons mounted on the sides of the Lucky 38 took down 8 more of them. And he probably would have got them all if that damn platinum chip had just been made a day earlier. But as for why the lands that House controlled were so specifically targeted, well, there's at least two possibilities. 
One of which is that he had some sort of falling out with the other board members and vault tech and it made him go off on his own so they would view him as competition and Moldaver has this great line where she references what Hank did to Shady Sands as just what vault tech did to its competition. So I think there's a good chance that vault tech could be behind all those nukes being sent at Mr. House simply because he posed the greatest threat to their dominance. Shit, maybe the other corporate members also received some nukes in their domain. There doesn't necessarily even need to have been a falling out. vault a pretty shady corporation. They could have just betrayed whoever thought was involved with them. Not that I think House would ever really be involved with them on anything other than a surface level. Which is why I think this is the more likely answer. Again, simply for them viewing him as the most likely winner of this great competition that they're talking about in the meeting. Why wouldn't vault hedge their bets? It seems like that's what they're all about. The other alternative is that he's lying in New Vegas about the number of nukes that he shot down or stopped, and it was part of his cover to make him look like this badass billionaire who single-handedly defended Vegas, which is how he's known in the uh, modern-day setting of New Vegas. He carved out the strip and organized the local tribals into the civilized business organizations that we see today. And sure, he may have dragged his feet a little bit with uh, getting around to that, since he only did it in response to the NCR's imminent arrival. But it was a smart thing to do because if he hadn't done it, NCR would have just steamrolled over him. Instead, he consolidated enough power to keep that from happening. But here's the thing though, the new Vegas we see in the end credits of Fallout Season 1, well, it looks a lot more blown to shit than it did the last time we saw it. Now this could be from the Battle of the Hoover Dam spilling over into the streets of New Vegas, even though it's a ways away. Or it could have just been destroyed in some sort of conflict between the NCR and Caesar's Legion, and that's if they adapt Caesar's Legion. And while it's possible it's a result of that conflict, it's not quite clear why it's blown to shit. I wouldn't be surprised if next season we see the Hoover Dam and it's also destroyed. With how villainous uh, vault Tech has become, I wouldn't be surprised if they might have had a hand in why Vegas looks the way it does, but we do see that NCR vertebrate in the wreckage near Benny's old place, The Tops. Or rather, what's left of it. What's also interesting of note is we see at some point a back gate to the strip was installed, and that appears to be what's breached with the piled up Securitrons right next to it. And that back gate sure would have been convenient when I was playing New Vegas, but uh, alas. You can kind of tell because the camera pans out southbound, and we see the iconic Welcome to Fabulous New Vegas sign. Which, as you can see from this shot from the game, didn't used to have a back gate. Interestingly enough, this side of the strip happened to be where the NCR embassy was located. It doesn't appear to have done so well. And unfortunately, it looks like the same goes for the Vault 21 Hotel. The NCR's main base in the Vegas region was also located right on the other side of this back wall. And that could imply that the damage we saw done to Vegas in the end credits could be the result of the NCR attempting to take Vegas by force. And again, the amount of dead Securitrons leads me to believe that House never got the Platinum chip to upgrade them with. Because once upgraded, those things are the most unstoppable army you could probably hope for. I'm not saying robots don't have their weaknesses, but they have the sheer amount of overwhelming force to definitely destroy the NCR and the Legion. Especially when the two other factions had been weakening each other through their four year long war after the first battle of Hoover Dam. And while Mr. House may have had the best possible army out of all the factions of New Vegas, there was only one problem. He could not access its full potential without having the platinum chip. So I definitely think there's a possibility that House never was able to get his hands on that platinum chip. That Benny made off with it and perhaps was killed with it in his possession and Caesar wound up with it, who was then maybe killed by the NCR who then went to war with New Vegas. Honestly, there's any number of possibilities that could arise out of the uh, state that New Vegas was in in the months leading up to the second Second Battle of Hoover Dam. And the introduction of the Vault Tech Cabal and House's knowledge of their existence further complicates things in a way I really enjoy. House never really struck me as a type who played to the same tune as his peers. He was a bit of an eccentric according to a ghoulified Danny Trejo. Mr. House also had no ill will towards the NCR. He sort of detested their leaders for trying to steal New Vegas from him, but he viewed NCR as a whole as his best customers, and he wasn't wrong. They really were. He had no desire for war with them. The Securitrons in their upgrade was sort of a deterrent, if you will, and to give Vegas the protectors it deserved. And I think Hank McLean, the character played by Kyle McLaughlin, his blowing up of Shady Sands would probably put him in a rather precarious place with Mr. House, if indeed Mr. House even knows who he is. I can't fathom a world where Mr. House doesn't want the vault Tech remnants destroyed. Even in the context of the show, he viewed them as his direct competitors, which is likely how they viewed him, so they probably want him destroyed just as much as he wants them gone. You can't impose your new world order on the land if somebody already beat you to the punch and is already doing it better. 
It all very much reminds me of the great game that Desmond and Calvert were locked in for over 200 years. Maybe Hank even framed House for the nuking of Shady Sands because it looks like there was some sort of war between Vegas and the NCR and that was something that House never wanted anyway. He was content to keep taking their money and remain independent, which he would be capable of doing with his new Securitron upgraded army. So I think all signs point to his army of Securitrons never being upgraded in the timeline of the show at least. And again, I could be wrong, anything's possible, maybe they did receive the upgrade and still lost, but again, what could have destroyed them like that? Look what they're capable of doing after they get the upgrade. What truly could stand against that? And again, before the upgrade, even House himself mentions that his Securitrons would have stood no chance against the NCR's military, which is why he recruited the three families, raised them up, civilized them, and made them casino families. He says himself the only reason the NCR didn't take Vegas by force is because he amassed enough power to bring them to the bargaining table. I mean, even then, he said he was certain that their leaders would have been willing to sacrifice as many lives as they needed to sacrifice to take Vegas and the Hoover Dam from him, but that the only reason they didn't is because they knew that the heavy casualties they'd incur doing that would leave them wide open for Caesar's attack and it would basically be handing it all to Caesar. And so a tense peace was established between Mr. House and the NCR. And while he doesn't consider them an enemy, he did view them as the biggest and most insidious threat to his reign of Vegas and his control. But Mr. House makes it clear he never wanted them gone. Unlike the Brotherhood and the Legion, who he definitely does want destroyed and it's sort of non-negotiable, the NCR was different. They were a society of customers after all, and Mr. House was nothing if not a capitalist autocrat. He basically planned to use their economy and Vegas to fund all of his future plans that he had, such as like space colonization and a bunch of wacky shit like that. Mr. House had plans for his relationship with the NCR. He stood to gain nothing if they were obliterated. So I really think that if Mr. House does in fact know who Hank is, that he uh, wouldn't like him, at least if he knows what he did to Shady Sands. I do think it would be more interesting if Hank has to seek out a, a tenuous partnership with House as a sort of gamble out of desperation. You could do a lot with a sort of complicated alliance like that as opposed to just making Mr. House another member of vault Tech's cabal. House seems more like the type who would want all of these other uh, former billionaires from his day out of the picture so he could be the last man standing to rule over everything that came next. That doesn't seem like something he would ever want to share with, you know, a council of people from his age. He'd rather, you know, groom a new apprentice to take his place. At least that was what I got from how he was portrayed in New Vegas with uh, him first grooming Benny and then the player. And that's groom and not the creepy way. Groom is in like the, uh, like how Jon Snow and Lord Commander Mormont, you know, he's uh, training him to replace him. But yeah, I can't imagine uh, Mr. House thought highly of Hank or even knows who he is. I mean, he was an executive assistant, but I don't think he was someone who was super acquainted with House. You know, he might have just known about what Mr. House is currently up to in Vegas, and that's why he's heading there, because he's another guy from his time. Which is something I hope they explore, because I've always read Mr. House as a uh, Daniel Plainview from There Will Be Blood sort of guy. I kind of got the feeling that he hated people, or at least people he felt he was in direct competition with. That's why he effectively made everyone his employee and was sort of like this business king of Vegas. But again, that's something that I guess uh, only time will tell about, but I definitely think that that's why Hank is heading towards Vegas, to seek out a uh, tense alliance with Mr. House. If he's even still left, I mean, we saw the uh, strip looks pretty much destroyed, the gates are blown apart, everything's all fucked in Vegas, but noticeably, the Lucky 38 is the one undamaged building. The pile of Securitron seems to indicate that he did try to stage some sort of defense of the strip, but uh, it's tough to say how successful he was. Again, his building is still standing though, so there's a good chance Mr. House is still kicking around. I'd say it's a 50-50 in the show whether he's still involved with any of the vault Tech executives that he was at that board meeting with, but I wouldn't be surprised if vault Tech's remnants have already overthrown House and are currently roosting in the Lucky 38. That's also a possibility. I mean, they did say, may the best man win. I keep calling them a cabal, but it was really in the loosest sense. These uh, people, they're all in direct competition with each other. I'd assume they'd all backstab each other just as soon as they'd look at one another, but who knows, maybe things are different 200 years after the apocalypse. If nothing else, though, I think that we could assume that if Mr. House is still around, he's in opposition with those vault Tech forces. Who knows, they could have just pinned the whole Shady Sands bombing on him, forcing the NCR to invade Vegas, weakening or potentially destroying both of vault Tech's potential competition. 
Then they can come in and establish dominance in the Mojave all from the safety of the Lucky 38 Tower. There's certainly a lot of possibilities. All we can really say definitively is that the NCR's conquest of Vegas failed. Which it really wasn't that surprising. See, in the games it wasn't because they got nuked, even though that is an option in one of the DLCs. The NCR's biggest problem was that it had sort of reverted back to the corruption of the pre-war times. There's a really great quest in New Vegas called Return to Sender, where you discover that the station chief of the Rangers, which is like the special forces division of the NCR's military, has been falsifying reports. And from him you learn that the NCR has basically been throwing its resources away into Vegas, a Vegas that does not want them or need them, like a meat grinder. And the NCR is more than happy to do that in the name of progress and the uh, mass riches that they believe they'll find in Vegas if they annex it. The politicians in the NCR ultimately don't really care what's going on in the frontier anyway as long as their interests back west are protected as Chief Hanlon states. The Vegas campaign was already slowly killing the NCR even if they didn't realize it yet. I mean if nothing else it had driven high ranking military personnel to falsify reports in hopes to get them out of Vegas because he saw the damage it was doing and that the campaign just wasn't sustainable. The NCR's fall wouldn't have been fast, but it would have been eventual. The NCR leadership figured that if they couldn't annex Vegas, they might as well just keep it as a buffer zone that kept the conflict with Caesar out of their own backyard. Perhaps in the name of keeping him from taking the dam. Meanwhile, the veteran military leadership like Chief Chris Christopherson here would prefer it if the NCR pulled out of Vegas completely and used its soldiers to fortify its own lands as opposed to just wasting them away in a useless campaign in the desert. So as you can see, the NCR was sort of in a fractious sort of place in 2281. How this big old conflict resolved between Mr. House, the NCR, Caesar's Legion, and the other factions would shape what Vegas looked like in the future. And without any courier intervention, the NCR's campaign into Vegas is ultimately doomed to fail. The NCR's corrupt and incompetent leadership made their fall basically inevitable. Vegas just sort of brought this to light. And there's one thing for certain, Caesar coming across to Colorado surely would have expedited that process. I imagine once he would have crossed into NCR lands, they would scramble to protect their Brahmin barons and their interests, and it probably wouldn't be hard for Caesar's frumentarius to sow dissent. Maybe even get the people to overthrow their leaders. I mean, who knows? Now, all that probably didn't happen in the uh, show's universe, unless they do adapt the Legion. I'm not really sure what they're doing next season. Who knows? But it's food for thought, and since uh, vault Tech has access to nukes, perhaps they found the divide. Who knows? Maybe they're the reason that New Vegas is in such a fucked off state. I mean, maybe Mr. House went against them and they made him pay the price. Or maybe it was the Tunnelers of the Divide. Personally, I'm hoping that's not the case, because House's whole thing in New Vegas was that he couldn't let either Caesar's Legion or the NCR take Hoover Dam on their own terms. So what I think happened was that the NCR or the Legion did in fact take the dam on their own terms, and House's army never got that upgrade it needed, so that's why we see Vegas in such a state. Hence the saddening sight of a pile of dead Securitrons. And for what it's worth, House had long ago calculated that a nuclear holocaust, apocalypse type thing was inevitable, and had already begun planning for what came after. I should probably do a video on Mr. House soon. But now we know from the show that he was also directly told by vault that they would be the ones pulling the uh, trigger, as it were, on the bombs. House had even more warning than we previously thought. And who knows how anything would have played out if that platinum chip had just been made a day earlier. And even without the chip, he still managed to defend the area around Vegas pretty successfully, even if he considers it suboptimal. But just by that brief shot we get of New Vegas, it might appear that all of his work has been in vain. And I think it's safe to say that when we do see New Vegas again next season, it's not going to look like how we remember it. We already got a little taste of that in the uh, credits. The casinos are ruined, the gates breached, and the Securitrons are dead. What an insanely huge revelation to dump on us in the form of end credits. I love how it seems designed to provoke theorizing and speculation, which is something I like to refer to as my bread and butter. They definitely knew what they were doing. I'm pretty sure New Vegas is probably the most popular Fallout game. It's definitely probably the most beloved. So all I can say is credit to them for making it the base of all the speculation that's going to come out in the next couple years until the new season drops. They knew it would get people thinking, that's for sure, showing us a shot of New Vegas like that. And I know people are up in arms about that chalkboard saying 2277 and then having that big atom bomb explosion next to it. But until I'm told otherwise, I'm choosing to believe that the NCR remnants view 2277 as the beginning of the end for their society, as that happens to be the year the first battle of the Hoover Dam took place. 
Not quite a defeat per se, but it was definitely NCR's first real loss of some kind. Also, Hank nuking Shady Sands in 2277 doesn't necessarily mean it's the end of the NCR as a whole. I believe their borders were from Arroyo all the way down to Baja in the south. Not to mention, if he did do his little bombing in 2277, a good part of the NCR's military was in fact in the Mojave. Not all of them, as I mentioned earlier. They were still protecting a good amount of their interests back west. But in no way would the nuking of Shady Sands equate the utter defeat and destruction of the NCR. There would be pockets of them, remnants, and I know we did see a remnant in the show, but there would be, uh, but there would be whole regions of the NCR that were unaffected by this uh, destruction of Shady Sands, so I'm interested to see what they do next. They talk about the NCR, though, that it's just dead and gone completely, and I suppose by 2296, when the show takes place, that could be the case, but we still don't exactly know how they all died off. We do see little bits of them, though. I'm guessing the Eric Estrada character was supposed to be a former desert ranger who is disillusioned with the NCR remnants because he doesn't really care for Moldaver too much. And honestly, I kind of liked the implication of that because the desert rangers were absorbed into the NCR because they were losing their fight against Caesar. And the NCR was like, okay, well, we'll protect Vegas if you guys join into our ranks as elite special forces soldiers. And since the desert rangers' backs were up against the wall, they didn't really have any choice in the matter, so they agreed. And from the looks of the end credits on that final episode, the NCR did not protect Vegas or the Mojave, so it kind of makes sense why Eric Estrada would have no love for the NCR remnant or its leader, especially when they're worshipped like some kind of god or something. But honestly, who knows what they're going to do with all this? We can only really wait and see. And there was a couple of other cliffhangers I wanted to talk about since we've uh, already spent so long talking about the big one, even though I got a little sidetracked here and there. But let's talk about a couple of the other ones while we're here. Now, other parts of this cliffhanger include the whereabouts of the Ghouls family, Cooper Howard. Now, I was under the impression that his daughter had perished because the last time we saw her, she was on horseback with him as the bombs were dropping. But he says to uh, Hank McLean, where's my family? Now, based simply just off of how villainous Barb was portrayed, I think it's at least a slight possibility that her vault tech remnant or whatever the group she's leading is, if she is still around, has taken the Lucky 38. Perhaps she's even overthrown Mr. House or maybe she uh, manipulated some of the local factions into doing that. But I think she's a force to be reckoned with and I don't really think we'll see Mr. House still alive by uh, season two, but who knows, I could be completely wrong. I think this one could really go either way. But there has to be some reason why after Walton Goggins asked Hank where his family was, he decided to run off to New Vegas. I mean, he knew Cooper wouldn't kill him there because he needed him alive to find out where Barb was, hence the little evil Mr. C smile Kyle McLaughlin gave us. But why go to New Vegas? I highly doubt Mr. House would give a shit about a vault tech remnant and the uh, consequences of his actions. But perhaps Barb is there. Perhaps she's allied herself or perhaps, like I said, overthrown Mr. House. He was the only one who wasn't impressed by any of vault techs little presentations 200 years ago. So maybe Barb even just set up shop in the Lucky 38 after House was gone to sort of dance on his grave. You could really do a lot of theorizing with this, I'm realizing. It's not surprising that his ex-wife Barb is still alive. She was uh, drinking the vault Tech Kool-Aid and all about a dollar long before the bombs dropped. I mean, she might have even been the one who pressed the button. So it's not shocking at all that she would still be kicking around somewhere, or rather frozen somewhere. But it's very interesting that his daughter is still alive. I almost expect they might do a uh, Sean from Fallout 4 type situation with Cooper Howard and his daughter if he does meet her again. Which would really suck for the old ghoul. Personally, I hope they don't do that because I wasn't the biggest fan of Fallout 4's story. Plus, I think it would be a little too on the nose. Another cliffhanger we got was uh, the fate of Lucy's brother, Norm. When we last saw him, he was trapped in Vault 31 by an aggressive Robo Roomba and told basically to wait out an undisclosed amount of time in his dad's cryopod until he could be let out. Now, I really enjoyed Brother Norman's story of uncovering this mystery in this abandoned vault filled with uh, people killed under equally mysterious circumstances. It felt very much in the vein of the games. Fallout 3, New Vegas, Fallout 4 even, there's countless vaults that have these, well for lack of a better term, really fucked up mysteries for you to uncover on what happened to its original inhabitants. Several of these experiments are sort of referenced offhandedly in that board meeting with the vault tech execs. Some of those ideas they mentioned led to the actual creation of vaults with those experiments. Vaults you could actually uncover and explore in the games. It's really cool. It's a really cool interactive experience this show now that I think about it. 
I really like how he uncovered it through terminal entries too. That was just a very, very nice touch. Totally in the same spirit of the games. In his story, I'm probably the most curious to see how it plays out. Like, what's going to happen with him next? Is his buddy going to come looking for him now that he's gone missing? We know that the overseer, Betty, was a vault tech employee as well, so she probably couldn't care less about what happened to Norman since he was getting too close to the truth. I don't know. Hopefully he doesn't die in there, though. Anyway, the other big cliffhanger was where the Brotherhood story left off this season. Cold Fusion sort of just falls into their lap, and the former NCR leader who's worshipped by its remnant has been killed by the Brotherhood. It's funny how the most advanced technological artifacts or things that the Brotherhood comes across are often the work of the Enclave. The Brotherhood's about preserving technology, not improving it. That's why everybody was so weirded out when Elijah was made into an elder despite being only a scribe. But anyway, the Brotherhood once again gets to claim the Enclave's work. And presumably this observatory, which I'm assuming is located in former NCR remnant lands. And I wonder how Siggy Wilson got his hands on that vault tech thing to make his cold fusion experiment. Because for whatever reason, a vault tech password was needed to activate it. Which leads me to believe that it was either something scavenged by the Enclave, or perhaps the Enclave was given a set of vaults by vault tech and that shadowy individual who was looking in on the board meeting was a representative of the Enclave, or the future Enclave. I definitely think it's possible. It's honestly one of the bigger mysteries to me why his cold fusion experiment was locked behind a vault tech password. Maybe I missed something though. Maybe I have to go back and watch that part. It's probably because Wilzig used vault tech equipment to conduct the cold fusion experiment, and the Enclaves had plenty of opportunities to acquire vault tech technology. Maybe the Enclave got it the old-fashioned way, and by that I mean they tricked some stupid vault dwellers into opening their doors and then promptly mowed them down and scavenged their tech, which is something we literally see them do in the intro to Fallout 2. The Roomba Brain Bud Askins makes an interesting comment when he says, you know, why would I preserve the last vestiges of a dead civilization when I could preserve my buds? Meaning his junior management staff, Bud's Buds. And I think the implication is that he was supposed to preserve government officials, politicians, i.e. the future Enclave, but chose instead to preserve vault tech staff, which could be why the Enclave does what it does to the unfortunate vaults it encounters. Anyway though, will the Brotherhood's discovery of this cold fusion experiment get the attention of the Enclave if they are in fact still around, which it seems to be the case in this show? Honestly, I'm not sure. I never really figured the Enclave would be featured very heavily in the show, but maybe they could in a future season. What I think is going to happen is that the Brotherhood's going to become a little bit more authoritarian than it already is, and after taking that cold fusion experiment, I mean, who's really around that could oppose them? The Enclave seems like it would be the obvious answer, but they seem to be all but eradicated on the West Coast, except for perhaps that small group that Wilzig was a part of, and maybe they weren't that small. But the Enclave's already taken two huge losses against the Brotherhood as it stands at the Oil Rig and Raven Rock, and then shortly after, the group that regrouped from Raven Rock was destroyed again at Adams Air Force Base, at the Mobile Crawler. So unless the Enclave's been recruiting this whole time, I don't really see it likely that they even have the numbers to take on the Brotherhood again, but again, we'll just have to wait and see. I do see the Brotherhood becoming even more villainous and controlling, though, in the next season, at the very least. But yeah, the main thing I wanted to talk about in this video was uh, the cliffhanger, where is Hank going, and that infamous board meeting that we saw in episode 8 of the Fallout series. And I think I covered all the things I wanted to talk about. This video is already longer than I planned. As always, though, I hope you guys found this to be uh, informative and at least somewhat enjoyable or entertaining. If you liked it, please like it. If you dislike it, please dislike it. And if you like hearing me ramble on about various things, usually lore-related, please consider subscribing. We're right about to hit 25k, which is a pretty big deal for me. I'm uh, always impressed at the amount of support I've been receiving, so I uh, can't thank you guys enough. If you feel the need to donate to the channel, I have a Ko-Fi account. I don't really know how to uh, pronounce that, but I'll link it in the description. I always feel like an e-beggar when I say that, but uh, yeah, let's have our outro and then some final thoughts, shall we? So yeah, I think after having uh, thought about the show for a while, I think my biggest gripe is the change to Frederick Sinclair's character. The TV's version of Mr. House seems to be spot on. We haven't really seen him do anything out of the ordinary yet. He was the only one who was sort of arguing against the uh, optimism of vault Tech's ideas. I think that's right on the money, and his whole detached and unimpressed demeanor was very much Mr. House. 
Sinclair, on the other hand, like I said earlier in the video, he might as well have just been a brand new character introduced for the show, as he's been changed probably the most considerably. Anyway though, I loved the show and how it handled the source material and just all the homages it paid, it was great. And the music, top notch, specifically the ghouls yodel theme, I fucking love that shit. It's like stuck in my head. But I've got some uh, shorter lore videos coming, I have one on the Bloodhound Knights that I've really just uh, wanted to do for a really long time, so I finally sat down and did one. And I also have that Demi-Human video I talked about, the Ordino one, the Desolation of Melania, and of course the Aldia video, which will probably come out in the middle of all those uh, shorter lore videos. At least, uh, that's my plan. Bloodhound Night one's almost done, so hopefully that'll be up tomorrow, but we will have to see, won't we? As always, though, I hope everybody stays safe, and I will see you next time. Years ago... When I detected NCR scouts roaming the Mojave, I could tell from their uniforms that these were no mere tribesmen. It was only a matter of time before an army appeared to take control of the dam, and I knew my Securitrons wouldn't be enough to oppose them.